if you need to. Right? So that's a little bit about Le Chatelier, which is what we're going to talk about today as well, a little bit. But it's just that's just a little interesting tidbit about the hey, what's known as the Haber process. He meant for it to be bad. He was trying to blow some stuff up. But it ended up turning out to be good. Uh, we found more efficient explosives, let's put it that way. Now notice you have the stoichiometric coefficients as exponents here for the KC. This exact setup, products over reactants always. There are two things we don't put in. We do not put in pure liquids or solids. This is what I have written up there. Again, KC, KEQ, there's no difference. I'm sorry. I need to close that. If we go back, and I've already shown you this once, right? PV equals NRT is gas. If you have a closed system, then the volume never changes. If you have a closed system, then you're never going to lose moles of gas that you start with. Again, law of conservation of matter says you can never get more or less moles of gas than you started with, which means that K, E, Q, and K, P, which is another expression, are equivalent, but they may not give you the same mathematical value. K, P is for dealing with the pressures of the gas. So instead of K, E, Q, we can write K, P, and Kp equals pressure of C, little c, pressure of D raised to little d, over pressure of A raised to little a, pressure of B raised to little b. And again, this pressure, all it has to be is in the same units, right? All it has to be in the same units. Why do they use E? Hmm? Why do they use E? Oh, I just, I don't know why they didn't put C and C. Maybe just to keep people from being confused about concentration. They probably just used D and E so that they didn't have to confuse people here. Same thing. Same thing. Arbitrary, they're just arbitrary placeholders. Arbitrary placeholders. Now, again, pressure is proportional to temperature too. So if you hold temperature constant, PV and RT doesn't really shift. Same thing here. These two numbers are not always the same, though. Not always the same. And this is uh, this reaction, I mean, sorry, this equation is in your reference material. You'll find it under equilibrium. You'll see Kp is equal to Kc RT delta N. You will have to use this. for a conversion from Kp to Kc. For conversion from Kp to Kc. Let's go ahead and use this reaction here. And I'm going to erase all of this. And if we're looking at this reaction, and we're looking at the fact that we have gases, then we see that Kp is equal to Kc RT delta N, where delta N is moles of gaseous product minus moles of gaseous reactant. So our delta N, which is the only thing that we need to uh, calculate in this particular case, is equal to 2 minus 1, which is equal to 1. So that means that our equation then becomes Kp is equal to Kc RT. And again, R is gas constant. You're going to want to use the uh, 8.0821. You're going to want to use, now when we're dealing with R here, you're going to want to use 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere Kelvin mole. And let's say I gave you KC, then you would just plug it in. Let's say I gave you concentrations at equilibrium, then you would plug those in, right? Because if Kc, we know, is equal to NO2 squared over 
in 204, then if I gave you these two concentrations at equilibrium, you can solve for Kp. If I gave you this value on its own, you can solve for Kp. All you would need to know is the temperature and the gas constant which is given to you. I mean, which is, which is a constant. I feel like I'm a triple man. And this is some, some data just to say that it doesn't matter which one you start with, which one is greater. The assumption is, is that due to the nature of the chemicals, due to the temperature that you have it at, a reaction in both directions is going to occur until equilibrium is reached. And all this graph is telling you is that the change in concentration of the product here and the change in concentration of the product here coming from two different directions. If this is the concentration of the product, then that means we didn't start with any product. And we saw very quickly that we see a change, we have a rate increase. Here we see a rate decrease, we see concentration of NO2 go down because we started with NO2 in this case. So in, in either direction you can get equilibrium whether you're going forwards or reverse in direction. Now here's a little basic math and, and fraction work, but it is very important to understand this, if you have a K that is greater than 1, meaning if we're dealing with a K EQ, let's say that equals 1.0 times 10 to the 3. then that means that the numerator must be much, 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 much larger than the denominator to get 1,000, right? Which means that at equilibrium, we're going to find mostly products. That's what that means mathematically. Mathematically means we're going to find mostly products when the equilibrium is great, much greater than 1. Now, if we're dealing with KEQ very much less than 1. Let's say we have a KEQ equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 4. Now we're saying that the denominator is much, 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 much bigger than the numerator. So again, from a from an inspection standpoint, if I gave you a KEQ of 7.9 times 10 to the negative 7, you would have to be able to tell me what predominates at equilibrium. Again, KEQ is a function of temperature. The only thing that can change KEQ is temperature. And I'm going to try to beat that in your brain, but we still, I, I see time and time again, there's only one way to change KEQ. You can shift the equilibrium temporarily, but when equilibrium returns, that K will still be the same. Regardless of what you do to it, you can heat it up, not heat it up. You can add stuff, you can take stuff away, you can pressurize, you can depressurize, but the equilibrium value will not change. Notice something. What do we notice about these two numbers that I gave you for KEQ? Where are our scientific inspection skills? What, what do we not see? We do not see units, correct. The reason for that. Equilibrium does not have any units, ever. The equilibrium constant does not have any units. Go ahead, write that down, get that across. I know we go back and forth with, I tell you, you better have units on everything. This is one of the very few times that you do not have any units. There are no units on any equilibrium expressions. Now somebody might ask, well how is it not any units when this is squared and this is to the first power? And again, there's some, there's some algebra that can kind of prove that to you as to why we don't have units, but we, uh, 
we won't get into that. Uh, I don't deal with this too, too much, but if you were to reverse the reaction, then you would have KR over KF, which means you would have the inverse of your original KC. So the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction is the inverse of this. So you would just flip these two, because then the product will become the reactant and vice versa. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, they show two different equilibrium constants, and they show them at the same temperature, but we see, if we did the math on that, we would see that those are the inverse of one another. And they explain the same thing. Now, this is, this is what's important, is that let's say that I ask you at equilibrium what species dominates. Fair question. What species dominates, if you, if you had to give me a general answer? Both of these numbers will give you the same answer. They should. So what species dominates based on this temperature and this reaction? N204. Right, N204 you would expect to, to be dominated. Now, this being squared might, you know, change your mind if you start to look at a little bit of math, but just looking at it, N204 would be the more predominant species at that particular temperature Celsius. And there's another one I don't, I don't tend to use. It's not really necessary. But if, let's say, we have multiplied the chemical equation by a number and multiplied it and therefore changed the stoichiometry of the reaction, then we would raise that number that we multiplied, uh, raise our original KC. But I, I don't use it. Very much. But this is just something that for you to know. I don't I don't ever put a problem like that in there. And here is where we kind of talk a little bit about uh, kinetics, right? When we have these multi multi-step mechanisms. The equilibrium constant of the overall reaction is the product of the two equilibrium constants. Again, these are not the two K values for the rate constant, these are the equilibrium constants. And we don't normally, there's plenty of problems for us not to have to go into little stuff like that. So this is, we're going back a little bit to why we don't have liquids and solids. Homogeneous equilibrium happen when we have everything in the same phase, such as in a liquid. We have everything dissolved in a liquid, we have homogeneous equilibrium. We have everything in a gas, such as this particular uh, reaction we're looking at, then we have everything in the same phase, the gas phase. We do have heterogeneous equilibrium when something is in a different phase, and we have, let's say, a solid interacting with the, with the gas or a gas interacting with a liquid. But whenever we're dealing with something that is considered pure, the concentration is always considered one, and therefore it falls out of the equation and we don't ever use it. So here is an example of limestone. So calcium carbonate is limestone for those that are geologists. And limestone is, is like a white, crusty, salty kind of looking, chunky looking material. Limestone does decompose over time to increase amounts of CO2 and calcium oxide. And notice that we have a pure solid, a pure solid, and a gas the equilibrium expression only involves the gas. So when we're dealing with KEQ, again I said do not put pure liquids or solids in the, in the expression. So therefore for the expression of calcium carbonate, We are only putting the equilibrium expression and showing it as it relates to CO, concentration of CO2. So they are directly related. At a given temperature, KEQ is CO, the concentration of CO2 in whatever you know, system you have it in, whatever closed container. 
again, we have to be dealing with close intent. And KP in this case is P pressure of CO2. use this as an as opportunity to, to look at our equation, our KP equation. Remember, there's also, we also have KP is equal to KC RT delta N. All right, so let's say that I gave you this value. Let's say I told you that at equilibrium, the concentration of CO2 was equal to 3.3 times 10 to the negative 2 mole. And I wanted you to give me the value for Kp. This is a very perfect example of some straightforward calculation being given equilibrium concentration. and solving for KP. This is the react. I'm telling you the equation you're using. Again, if you go back, remember what delta N is. Make sure that you can set that up and get a value. Uh, and I guess I have to give you the temperature too. Let's say temperature is at, we'll just say 100 degrees Celsius. Again, a lot of these values for temperature, they're not, they, they're not arbitrary, but they're, you know, most of the time, I wouldn't say they're made up, but the values of them, you need to just be able to use and plug them in and look at the differences in the value. Did we increase temperature? Did we decrease temperature? So on and so forth. All right, so first couple of things. We need KC, RT, and delta N, realizing that the RT and delta N are all in parentheses. So our KP is equal to KC, RT, delta N. What is our delta N? One. One, positive. Because we have one gaseous product, we have zero gaseous reactants. Therefore, N is, delta N is equal to 1. All right, our T is equal to? 373. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of our 
gas law. We see, we see our R value will give us a temperature unit that should explain to us why we should convert. Okay, and our R is equal to 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere Kelvin mole. Why are we picking that R? Because liter atmosphere, we're talking about gas. Okay, so we have everything. Do we have KC? KC is KEQ, and KEQ in this case is concentration of CO2. And since concentration of CO2, we only have one here as stoichiometric coefficient, we're dealing with this concentration equal to KEQ. So KP is equal to 3.3 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. RT, so we got 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere Kelvin mole times 373 Kelvin raised to the 1, which means that all we're dealing with here is a multiplication problem. And she gets some small number question. Would you keep the units if you're using a 3.3 for the equilibrium, like the mole? Uh, you're actually, yeah, you're actually not using these units. Yeah, so you're not using these. I'm giving, I have to give you this as the concentration, but yeah, the KEQ doesn't have any units. Even though I put the units here for liter atmosphere, Kelvin mole, and all you're left with is liter atmosphere per mole, you, you still have no units down. I just write these here just to make sure that you see where I got kind of where I got it from. But again, your final answer for your K never has any units. Two times 0.0821. Yeah, 1.01. So notice though that our equilibrium value, K is much smaller than our KP. They are not equivalent. They are not the same, right? So KP and, and KEQ or KC, you can't look at them and, and be able to guess what the other one is, right? It would be very difficult for you to do that. But here is an example of being able to solve for KP being given KC. Obviously, you're going to have to be able to do the reverse as well. Being given KP, solve for KC, which would be KP divided by RT delta N. Okay, so now we got to switch gears a little bit and, and move into the math, the more, I would say, algebraic side of things when we're dealing with equilibrium. And these are the type of problems that you're going to see uh, more frequently, more frequently. And I'll leave this for right now because we might use this. So when we're dealing with determining equilibrium concentrations, essentially finding out what the concentration that equilibrium should be. See, I've been giving you all these scenarios where I'm telling you what it is. What if I don't tell you what the concentration is? Can you deduce and find it? And you have to be able to. And so to calculate the change, we have to use the balance equation, which is this first line up here. We have to use what we start with, and we have to be able to either use the equilibrium constant to calculate the concentrations, or calculate the equilibrium constant using the equilibrium concentrations. Okay, so this this is the one that's. It, this is a this is. A very basic problem, but again, you're going to have to follow me because this is not, uh, this is some new, new ground, if you will. So we have hydrogen and iodine probably a gas at this point, at that temperature, comes together to create 
hydroionic acid gas, let's say. We have a closed system. The expectation is that we're always talking about closed system here or else we start dabbling in the, the inability to determine concentration. And if we can't determine concentration, then we're kind of pointless to be looking at equilibrium. They're, they've told us in the problem that H2 is equal to 1.000 times 10 to the negative 3 mole. They've told us that I2 is equal to 2.000 times 10 to the negative 3 mole. And there's a very important line in this that says, well, they give us a temperature, but they tell us that it is allowed to reach equilibrium. They didn't tell us how long it took. They didn't tell us whether it was a you know, unimolecular or multi-step mechanism. Again, we don't care about any of that stuff, right? We don't care about any of the kinetic stuff. They've done away with any thoughts about kinetics when they tell us it was allowed to reach equilibrium. They're telling us the next time we take a look at this, we're worried about equilibrium only. And we were able to analyze the equilibrium mixture, whether it be titration, whether it be, uh, you know, however, visual inspection, whatever. And we, UV vis, which is what we're going to use this uh, next week. And we were able to give, they were able to give us HI. They were able to give us the concentration at equilibrium. So at equilibrium, HI equals 1.87 times 10 to the negative 3 mole. And they want us to determine KC. All right. So, so one of the beauties, I think, of chemistry is that as much as you might feel that you've learned stuff along the way that you might not have to use again, there are some basic, you know, standalone concepts that will always come into play. But also being able to, to think in chemistry, like, thought process is very important. So if we initially had only reactants, we only had hydrogen and iodine, then what is the concentration of the product initially? Zero. Zero, right? We have been told that over a certain amount of time, doesn't matter how long, we don't care, because this is not connected, we eventually get an amount of product that is 1.87 times 10 to the negative 30. That product had to come from the reactants. the reactants coming together to form that product, right? So if we form product in a chemical reaction, we must have lost some we must have lost some reactants. That's the law of conservation of matter. We cannot make things out of nothing. We cannot make things out of nothing. All right. So if that is the case, and we know the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction, then we can determine directly, since it is a closed system, since matter, law of conservation of matter, we have the information to tell us how much of these are left. How much of these are left? Stoichiometry will tell us that. From, from Jenkins 1, stoichiometry will tell us that if we made this much, then how much of these two were used up? And again, it's about half, right? It's about half because two stoichiometry. We do not use that structure to solve equilibrium problems, but it, realize that the structure that I'm about to show you, the table I'm about to show you, is stoichiometry. It's just written in a different way. So we have what's known as an ice table. And this stands for initial <laughs> change and equilibrium. And you won't see me write these words out again. 
you just see ICE. You generally see some lines, maybe. I don't normally do the lines, but you can. And this is what we call ice table. And the ice table is putting in information that we know, using the ice table to determine information that we don't know. So information that we do know, we know the initial concentrations of all species. The initial concentration of H2. The initial concentration of HI, zero. Got to remember that. A lot of people can, can find themselves confused there. You don't have any product yet. OK? Other part of this table that we know is that we were told that the equilibrium concentration for the product is 1.87 times 10 to the negative 3. Now here's where the testing of your algebraic skills comes back into play. For us to determine the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen and iodine, what do we need to find out? To get the answer to these two boxes, we need to find out what. Change. The change, right. We need to find out the change. So do we think that these numbers are going to be larger or smaller than these? Small, small. They have to be smaller. OK, so we, we, we got the right mathematic reasoning. We need to find these two values. As far as it pertains to the reactants, do we have any way to do this? Just looking at the reactants portion of the table, do we have any way to find change? Uh, yes. No. Just looking at H2 and I2, we don't. Just looking at H2 and I2, we don't. Now, if we look at the products, do we have a way to determine change? Yes. Are these three boxes related? How? They all equal one times 10 to negative third. I'm sorry, they all equal three times 10 to negative third. No. Each of these boxes are related via stoichiometry. That's why I was telling you. This change box is where stoichiometry comes into play. So for every one H2 you lose, you gain two of these. For every one I2 you lose, you gain two of these. So algebraically, what will we put in, these, in this first box? Negative one or negative one or negative one. Well, see, y'all using one. Why are you using one? We don't know that's one. It should be negative. That's half. Two. X. Negative X. Because we don't know the amount. We well, it would be negative. This divided by two. We'll see. That. So now that we have a relationship between the change in concentration and the initial concentration, we can essentially fill out all of these boxes to be 1.000 times 10 to the negative 3 minus whatever amount was used up, 2 minus whatever amount was used up, and 0 plus whatever amount was gained times 2, x. So therefore, if we started with zero, we end up with this, then our change has to be equal to this. Mm -hmm. right. Our change has to be equal to this. Hopefully we see that. Therefore, if we go over here and do a little math before we get to KC, we can determine that 2x is equal to 1.87 times 10 to the negative 3. And therefore, x is equal to 1.87 
times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 2, and therefore x is equal to 9.35 times 10 to the negative 4, right? 9.35 times 10 to the negative 4. So if x equals that value, then we can come back into here and say that we have now a value for x. And we can say that this needs to be 9.35 times 10 to the negative 4, 9.35 times 10 to the negative 4, and 2 times 9.35 times 10 to the negative 4. Which means that these values at the bottom are going to be what? The initial minus the change. Initial, right? Initial plus the change in this case. Minus the change we add. But initial plus your change. And if you plug this in, what do you get? You end up getting some small number, right? Point five times ten to the negative five for this first one, and one point zero six five times ten to the negative three for this second one, and one point eight seven. So we were given a, in this, uh, a concentration at equilibrium of HI, which was able to give us the change, which was able to give us the equilibrium concentrations of everything else. We're still not done because the last step of this problem was for us to determine KEQ, and therefore KEQ is equal to product over reactants, Remember, stoichiometry dictates exponent. We have a 2 here. So this equals 1.87 times 10 to the negative 3 squared all over 6.5 times 10 to the negative 5 times 1.065 times 10 to the negative 3. KEQ equals fifty-one. That's just one style of problem. Plenty of beautiful problems. So, um, if we were asked to find KP for this, um, and we were given KC, would KP just equal KC because delta zero raised to zero. zero? Right. Yeah. Okay. KP equals KC in this case because we don't have any change in moles of gas. Right. You get two minus two, but here KEQ equals fifty one. Now, from a qualitative standpoint, which is the other kind of question that you can ask, just because you can do the math, that's good. Then I ask you, what does this KEQ say about this reaction? Favors the products? Greatly, right? Favors the products greatly. So if you get these two reactants in a vessel at 443, whatever the temperature was, you are going to get your product, right? You're going to get your product. Now, how long that's going to take you got to go back to kinetics. You don't know. But we know that equilibrium is favored. Now, the best example of that, and, and we normally have a few more ladies in here, but women love diamonds, right? They love diamonds. And we, the statement is that diamonds are forever. But the actual equilibrium and the thermodynamics of diamonds turning back into coal is actually favorable. So the equilibrium exists for diamonds actually to turn back into coal. But the kinetics are millions and millions of years. So again, just because something equilibrium favors 
doesn't mean that you'll ever see it happen, right? There are plenty of people who've done this way back in the day when they were doing it. They say, man, it's supposed to happen. And then they found out that the kinetics is the reason why they didn't see it. Okay, um, let's take a quick break, quick break. I know. And then what we'll do is we'll go into another type of question using the ice table because I want to make sure that we're comfortable with the ice table because that's only one style of question. That's you being given an equilibrium concentration. Now I have to be, show you when you're not given an equilibrium concentration how to solve that too.